and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may, before, but they, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Amen. The word of God, the people of God, thanks be to God. You may be seated in the presence of God on this morning. Amen. Let us pray. Most eternal in our lives, God, Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. For truly it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask, Father, right now in the name of Jesus that you use this word. Use me, Lord. Lord, strengthen me where my cup, Lord, is empty or half full. And allow me, Lord, to exhaust what you have given me in this word so that our people, all people, including myself, oh God, will be able to hear your word and be transformed, transmogrified, transfigured by it. And allow us, God, to continue to walk in footsteps that are right in your sight and not our own. For we have no righteousness, Lord. Lord, the only righteousness that we have is the righteousness that comes from you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you continue to do. Bless us now and keep us. Let this word go in faith. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 For the time that I was on this morning, I want you to look at your neighbor. Amen. I want you to look at your neighbor. It's okay. Amen. I'm not going to bite you. Amen. Amen. I just want you to help me introduce the sermon on this morning. Just tell the neighbor. Yeah. Oh, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. There's, There's no preview. No preview. Like God's. Like God's. Preview. Turn to your other neighbor, amen, and just tell the neighbor, neighbor. oh neighbor, oh, neighbor. There's, no preview. there's no preview, like God's, God's. Preview. preview, amen, amen. Thank you for helping me introduce the title of the message on this morning, amen. There's no preview, like God's preview, there's no preview, like God's preview. Church, due to my busy schedule, oftentimes I catch movies late. Sometimes it's a good thing because maybe I can get it on discount. Amen. I don't have to pay as much. You know, all the hoopla is kind of uh, dissolved down and I don't have to pay full price because now not as many people are trying to see the movies. So things are kind of pulled down. But one of the things I love, especially in this day and time, is uh, the nuance and the suspense that is tied to movie previews. Oh, come on, church. I, I, I'm going to tell you, if you didn't want to go see Creed 3, something's wrong. When I, when, I, when I look at the preview, the preview, I'm seeing these brothers cut up and, 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 and I'm seeing uh, uh, Michael B. Jordan and uh, this other brother who's making his scene. I'm seeing this and I'm like, man, I gotta see this movie. It's something about a good preview. Anytime a Star Wars movie comes out, yeah, yeah. and that's one of my favorite, y'all didn't know already. Uh, if that movie comes out, you can rest assured, I'm gonna probably be the first one to see it because I've been a Star Wars fan because Star Wars was the first movie that I ever saw. Amen. When, when, yeah, when, 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 when Obi Wan Kenobi was the old man. Amen. Yeah. Darth Vader, amen, killed him. Amen. Unfortunately, and, amen. And the stormtroopers and all the other stuff that went to that first '70s film. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Came out in the late '70s. I was a '75 baby. Amen. And, and I saw that movie. I think about 1980, 81, or something of that nature. And I was, I was, I was up. Amen. And with that, it's amazing to see a movie preview because it begins to ante you up for scenes and for the movie itself. And they give you just enough to wet your palate. 
Amazing how the movie preview is set up that, that there are all these enactments. They make sure to get certain highlights and so forth in. Again, I told you I'm a Star Wars fan. And one of the things when I think one of the episodes came out when Yoda was younger, but for some odd reason he was still walking with a cane. And when I saw a preview where he literally had this look on his face like he was about to get down. And he literally pulls back his cloak like this takes his hand and pulls it out this way. And the lightsaber from the left side moves up and catches his hand. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and that's what I I'm like, Yoda is about to throw down. <laughs> and everybody who's a Star Wars fan was ready because they had never seen Yoda fight. And when I was in the movie theater, when, when that scene came up, I was like, the way they panned it, and when they spun it around, and all of a sudden they had a spin was like, ah. and then the lightsaber comes up, and I'm like, it's on, it is on. And then when he starts flipping and jumping and all this stuff, I'm sitting in the theater, my wife's looking at me like I'm crazy. She's like, Sean, what's wrong with you? I'm like, yo, it's getting down. <laughs> Nobody has seen y'all to fight. We didn't think y'all could fight, but he can. And so with this, the previews any you up for the main event, yeah. a Creed three, for example. Yeah. And as you up, you get to see, you don't see the match, but you know there's gonna be a throw down. And because of that, it builds some level of excitement yeah. Yeah. about what you haven't seen yet. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say that again? Yeah. Yeah. It builds up excitement about what you have not seen yet. Church, this is where we see biblical previews. When we go to the Bible, let me help you. Every, not every aspect of the Bible, but I would say much of it, points directly to the cross. Can, can I help you? That's in Genesis. But watch this correlation, church. Abraham is called by God. Says that he's going to have a son at 100 years old. His wife overheard the conversation. She laughs. 90 years old, she has a baby. And she figures, well, if I laugh about it, that's why I may as well name him. So they named him Isaac, which actually means laughter in Hebrew. Now, church, what you have is a son, a son who's born, that God immediately says, now I want him back. I gave him to you, now I want him back. Now, see, the cliffhanger is this, is that, wait a minute, Abraham just got it. He asked for, asked for a son, he got it. But now God says, I want him back. Well, there must be something resting in Abraham, but scripture doesn't really tell us. But he begins to obey God and gets to obey God and says, okay, I'm going to sacrifice my own son. So watch this. There must be some level of faith that Abraham had because if he's telling him, God told Abraham that the lineage of his very nation would come through Isaac. And now he's asking that, asking for Isaac back for Abraham to kill him. There has to be some faith that Abraham believes that Isaac really isn't going to die, even if he kills him. So watch this. Abraham goes through with it. He takes some wood, puts it on Isaac's back. Watch this. Isaac is carrying it up a Mount Moriah hill. As he's carrying it up a hill, I hope you see some familiarity. He has wood on his shoulder. And he's carrying it up a hill called Mount Moriah. Let me let you know something. Mount Moriah is actually the very place where Jesus Christ himself was crucified. Okay. So he's climbing up a hill called Mount Moriah that over 2,000 years later, Christ will be crucified on. Isaac is carrying up the wood on, on up to the hill. They get to the altar. Isaac says, Father Abraham, we have the altar, we have the wood, 
But where's the sacrifice? Now watch this. This is when Abraham says, the Lord will provide the sacrifice. This is when we get that term, Jehovah Jireh. Now, now watch this. So, he's about to kill him. Abraham is about to kill Isaac. Draws the knife. God shows up, says, don't do it. And he drops the knife and says, now, I know, Abraham, that you love me. Because you are willing to sacrifice your son. Your only son. That's what scripture says in Genesis. In Genesis, I can show it to you. Now watch this. So he doesn't kill Isaac because Isaac's blood doesn't do anything for us. With this church, Isaac's blood didn't do anything for us. So killing him would have meant nothing. But if the covenant that was going to go through Abraham was going to come through Abraham, Abraham had to feel a small aspect of what God was feeling right then and there that he would have to do over 2,000 years later. Okay. Now watch this. He goes, and there is a ram in the bush. Now, mind you, Israelites couldn't kill female lambs. It was a ram. It was a ram. What is a ram? A ram is a male lamb. The ram is a male lamb. And guess what, church? Not only is it caught, it's caught in a thicket. You'll get it in a minute. There's a thicket on its horns. You know what a thicket is? A thicket sounds like thorns to me. There's a crowd of thorns that's on top of the head of the lamb that was going to be slain. Surely, church, Spielberg and Perry, Tyler Perry, they couldn't even draw up a scenario like this. This is a God preview. And church, that's when Abraham slays the lamb. Story is over. But what is important to you? It points to what's going to happen. Let me help the church. You want another one? <laughs> I've got seven. So, church, we remember a man by the name of Samson, the last judge, who had a sex addiction problem. He didn't he had a sex addiction problem. However, God called him to be a judge. Well, what happens is, is that sin got the best of him. He lost his strength because he got a bootleg haircut. And because of that, by, by, by a woman by the name of Delilah, that now, now, he's now in prison by the ones he should be fighting. But watch this. He prays to God, and they're in their temple, worshiping an idol God, and he asks God, at least in this moment, give me my strength back. And I will do your work and do your will. So what happens? Samson, he asks to be lean on two pillars. One on his left and one on his right. I hope you see it. <laughs> so he edges himself and he starts to push. And he keeps pushing until the whole building falls down. Samson is killed. Samson dies. But he killed 3,000, which represented the aspect of sin in that time. Sin was exterminated. Samson pushed. Pushed. And the building came down. But watch this. Samson, if you didn't know, Samson just happened to be a Nazarite. You'll get it in a minute. Samson is from Nazareth. He's a Nazarite. 
And the last time I checked, I remember when a Nazarite was placed in a place where he had to stretch himself, and he was stretched out, but he killed sin forever on that day. Church, I told you. Watch this church. The last plague in Egypt, Moses tells Pharaoh what? He says, your firstborn will die. They will die. However, an angel comes and tells Moses to get the children of Israel, the, the, the children of Israel together in Goshen. What you need to do at the time of Passover, you need to uh, uh, kill a lamb, okay? You need to kill a lamb. Remember, the lamb has to be met. You must kill him, and you must eat him, but you also must bring other people into your house to share the lamb with you. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, yeah. Now, watch this, church. But he says that death is coming tonight. So what you need to do you need to take the blood of that man that you killed, and you need to take it, and you need to smear it on the doorpost. You need to smear it on the doorpost so when the death angel sees the blood, death won't enter your house. You ain't got it yet. So death doesn't come to your house unless you got the lamb's blood the wood post of your door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Church, you want to talk about preview. This is what God has done through his word countless times over. And I'm looking right here in my notes and I've got four other examples I can go through to show you how that is. Since it's Women's History Month, I need to throw a woman in there. So let me go ahead and go, go there. There's a woman by the name of Esther. And Esther happens to be one of the princesses that gets kind of raised to a queen in the house of King Artaxerxes of Persia. Now what happens is she's a Jew. But there's this dude named Haman who can't stand Esther and can't stand her cousin Mordecai. And so what he does is he has the king sign an edict to say that if they bow down to any other thing other than the king, they should die. Matter of fact, they should be hung. The only place you get hung from is a tree. Watch this church. So Esther knows uh, what's about to happen, but she don't want to say nothing. Mordecai steps up and tells Esther, says, if you don't say something, you're going to die too. Wow. But you're in the king's house. Wow. You're in the king's house, but if you don't say anything, you too will die. So what does that say, church? That says Esther needs to do something. And that's when Mordecai says, don't you, or maybe, maybe you were brought up to this position for such a time as this. And because of that, because she spoke up to the king, death got flipped. And so the sin that Haman tried to hang them with, he ends up getting hung himself. And Esther and their family and the Jews continue to live and they don't die. Again, church, all these examples are only previews to the cross. And the last one is the scripture that we're in today. You have this aspect of reality of Lazarus dying. And I have to ask the question, that will lead into this to help explain some things is what does the what does the Lazarus to Jesus preview show us before we get to Resurrection Sunday? What does the Lazarus to Jesus preview show us before we get to Resurrection Sunday? 
Let me help you. I've got a few points, and I'm going to be out your, be out your way. Again, the question is, what does the Lazarus to Jesus preview show us before we get to Resurrection Sunday? Well, what it shows us, church, it shows us that stones must be removed before anything can be lifted up. Let me say that again. Stones have to be removed before anything can be lifted up. Let's go to the text. Jesus has already cried. Jesus wept. If you look a few verses before that, what you have here is that Jesus is moved. He's moved to go to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah. The tomb that he goes to, yeah. where Lazarus is buried, has a stone rolled in front of him. Yeah. He asked somebody to move the stone. I hope you see the preview. Because yeah. in two weeks, there's not, not going to be anybody there, human, to move the stone. Yeah. But you're going to have Jesus be raised from the dead. And the stone is going to be removed by God himself. He's going to take the seals off. And remember, they didn't just roll a stone in Jesus' case. They rolled a stone, sealed it in, and put seals on it. they like, nobody will steal his body. But the third day, the stone was rolled away. So Jesus tells them, them in this instance, I need you to roll the stone away. Watch this. I don't know what stones you have rolled over you right now. I don't know what stones are having you crippled and making you stumble in your life right now. I don't know what stones are, are, are hampering you from a deeper relationship with God. I don't know what stones are in your life that need to be but at some point, in order to lift what's inside the cave, inside the tomb up, the stones gotta be rolled away. And you can't do it. God has to roll that stone away for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's an obstacle towards your resurrection. And because of that, church, that begins a process with God that says that stone has to be moved. God can Jesus said somebody has got to move the stone in order for the resurrection to take place. Yeah. What you need to be resurrected from? What addictions? I don't know. Maybe it's going to pour, but I don't know. But whatever you're praying to God for, there is a stone rolled over. That's prohibiting you to get what God has for you. Yeah. Watch this church. When this happens, God Jesus says, take the stone away. But now, Martha says, the brother of Lazarus says, wait a minute. If you do that, he's been in there four days. It stinks. It smells. He's been dead for four days. Watch this church. There's a lot of stuff that we have in our lives that we have stones covered up. Sometimes we don't want those stones removed because we know there is a fuck fest going on behind the stone. But in order for the, for the resurrection to take place, you gotta deal with the honor, the badness, the stinkiness, the fuckiness of it in order for it to be lifted. Church, don't worry about what you spend. We have a God who has the supreme deodorizer. He can accent, scent air. He can make sure to perfume that thing the way it is, but it's not a cover up. What he wants to do is deal with the issue and the problem in order to lift it up. The perfume is just a garnishment. But the reality is, is that it has to be resurrected first in order for it to truly be cleaned up. Church. Stones must be removed before anything can be lifted. My second point, I'm gonna be brief. What does the Lazarus to Jesus preview show us before we get to the resurrection of Sunday? 
It shows, church, that you must pray before you receive power. You must pray before you receive power. Watch this. <sighs> Jesus says, it answers Martha, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? After he tells her that, the next thing he does, he looks up to God and starts to pray. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Watch this. The power of God works, even in Jesus' case, by way of the prayer that is illustrated here. What he does is before he speaks commands, he ushers the power of God and gives God glory first before even taking him at all. So what does that say? At the end of the day, whatever issues that you had to roll that storm away in order to deal with the fuckiness and the badness and the bad odor of it, what God is going to do is once you go through the process of praying over that which you know is decaying, that's when God is going to begin to work in your life to resurrect that situation. But you make sure that you give God glory first before God gets the glory. Because the glory goes up to God in prayer. But once, once that's done, God's power ushers in and begins to reform that situation in your life. Prayer works. If you pray first, there's power next. And that power begins to lift things up and begins to resurrect and clean some things out. Don't let someone tell you, you ain't got to pray. You don't need to pray. Just be a good person. You'll be fine. No, you need to pray, sweetheart. Brother, you need to pray. Because the prayer says, I have enough faith that I can't do it on my own. God, I need your power to resurrect the situation in my life. And when you start praying, that's how you get power. Because you have enough faith to believe. Lord, I'm limited. Lord, I don't have much. But you have it all. And because you do, and I believe in you, you're going to resurrect this situation. Prayer leads you in to power. God's power. Yeah. My last point, very quickly. What does the Lazarus to Jesus preview show us before we get to Resurrection Sunday? Church, it tells us that you must speak life into death before dead space can be resurrected. Let me say that again. You must speak life into death before dead space can be resurrected. After Jesus prayed, the next thing that comes out of his mouth, which I'm, if I'm not mistaken, is in the Greek imperative. After he prayed, it says, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Remember, you don't have power until we pray. But once you pray, God gives you power so you can call those things that are not as though they were. And now what happens is Jesus speaks because his cup has now been filled and overflowing. And so he uses command language and says, Lazarus, come out. And church, if you don't believe, just try it by faith. Those things that you need for God to help you to come out of. Watch this church. I need to use just another biblical example. That man at Gergesenes. Gergesenes, that was the place where he was, uh, he was delusional and uh, he was had fits and acting crazy. And so the demons that were inside of him, Jesus started to speak to. Now watch this. Jesus speaks to those demons. But what he does 
It's not one demon. He speaks to every demon that was in this man. And he says, come out of him, you unclean spirit. What is your name? And every demon began to name itself to Jesus because Jesus had authority over the demons and began to call them out one by one by one by one. How do you know that, Pastor? You only said it one time. No, I know because the Greek language is in the imperfect form, and the imperfect form is a continual form, which means that Jesus didn't just say it one time. He kept saying it. Come out of this man in one clean spirit. What is your name? My name is addiction. Well, you need to come out. Come out of this man in one clean spirit. What is your name? Well, my name is alcoholism. Well, alcoholism, you got to come out too. What is your name, you unclean spirit? What is your name? My name is adultery. Well, this adultery spirit needs to come out. What is your name, you unclean spirit? What is your name? Your name is whatever sin that the demon called out, God called it out of him. And because of this church, this is what happens, is that life, when you speak life into something, all the dead stuff has to come out, and that gives you the authority by way of the Holy Spirit to call every devil in hell, every demon, demonic spirit that's trying to encompass you or somebody else that you call.
Y'all would have got mad at me. Like, Pastor, you walked right through the Bible. You kept going back and forth, holding back to the cross. Well, let me help you. Everything that's in the Bible, in some aspect, is going to point towards the cross or back to the cross. That's the reality. And that's why I love Old Testament to New Testament theology. Because you're able to point out these occurrences that God allowed to happen. And when you realize it, you'll realize you're actually still talking about the cross. Church, that preview, God's preview, was the setup of what would happen at the empty tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea was the one who gave his tomb up and said, put Jesus there. But something tells me Joseph of Arimathea did it because I believe he knew the preview and he had a clue as to what would happen. Because he said Jesus only needs it for a temporary stay. Because in three days, he's going to be raised from the dead. And it takes faith to give a monetary investment of something that you have insured yourself with and say, I'm giving that up so that Jesus can have it. But guess what? I know Jesus is not going to need it long, so I know it's on borrowed time. Church, as we move toward Resurrection Sunday, take these aspects of what the Word of God tells us and what this scripture has shown us. Why would God allow for this scenario narrative to happen? Because God knew what was about to happen. But he gave us a preview of what Christ would ultimately do. And if you don't believe in Jesus Christ based off all these synchronizations that are in the Word of God, I can show you all day. Matter of fact, there are mathematical equations that are in the Word of God that point where? To the cross. There's a man by the name of King Sennacherib who died in 539 B.C. There's a calculation that is there, literally, in the Word of God that points directly to 32 or 33 AD. 33 AD, what happened? Calvary. And because of this church, this is why there's so many ways that people can come to the salvation of Christ. And God has numerous ways of showing it. But before you can get that salvation, you have to believe. So I'm telling you, God has a preview, and the preview leads us in to greater clues, to investigate, to see the magnificence and power of God in the land of the living. I'm done preaching. Church, there may be someone who does not know Jesus Christ and be part of their sins. Amen. You may come. It's a Catholic baptism of Christian experience in my letter. You may come. Whatever you need or whatever you desire, God truly has the answer for you. Doors of church open.
There's no preview like God's preview. And it's so good to be able to know, amen, when you read these passages, how much it points back to Calvary, points back to the empty tomb. Amen. I thank God for it. Amen. I pray that you take this message and let it just resonate with you. Amen. Again, to help you along the journey. Amen. And show the direction that amen. The direction of the Bible always points either forward to the cross or back to the cross. Amen. We thank, thank God for everyone here and for our musicians, for our choir, for our ushers that are on the floor, all the officers, uh, officers here at the church, and for all of you in the midst of worship. Yes, it's time to go now. Amen. We need a good word now. A good word called benediction. Amen. That leads us, amen, into the auspices of the world and allows us to teach, to preach, and proclaim the good news of the preview that gives us a greater clue. Amen. As you bow your heads with me at this time, Father God, we thank you for this worship experience. What we've experienced in your word today. Bless us and keep us, Lord, in every, in every way, shape, fashion, and form. Thank you, Lord, for your preview. There's no preview like yours, oh God, that gets us excited about Resurrection Sunday. We thank you, Father, for all that you continue to do in our lives. Bless us and keep us as we leave this place, but not from your holy presence, and give us mercies wherever we're going to allow the Spirit of God to work in us and through us so that we can continue to give your name, praise, honor, and glory.
All right, let's see if this works, man. After a couple years, you know, a master of breaking yourself out of this. I had to open the door. You don't deserve one. Oh, you here today? You might get a check. <laughs> Yeah. I know he ain't going to. 